uh, Michelle uh, for the invitation. Uh, thanks to um, the center for also facilitating some of the financial support that made it possible for me to be in the UK and to spend time with uh, Mission Flora in particular. Uh, thanks also to Mission Flora to, for facilitating the connection with, with you and uh, being your advance guard to check us out. <laughs> <laughs> that we were, we, were, we, were, we were in the new South Africa rather than the old. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I also want to just acknowledge uh, my old friend, uh, John Bennington, uh, one of my oldest <laughs> friends. Uh, oh, the closest. Yes. Long standing. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Um, uh, John, I think, is probably the, the closest thing I've ever had to a mentor. Uh, we, uh, we met in, uh, in South Africa in 1992 when he came to work with a network of NGOs that I'd set up in South Africa to support urban social movements who were engaged in rent boycotts, consumer boycotts, and, in, and negotiations with the state around the reconstitution of local government. And John had a, a long history of activism in the British context, working with local governments, uh, himself as a local government manager in Progressive. Which city was that? that you? Coventry. Coventry. Manchester. And before that, yeah. Man Moss Side. Yeah. Built in Coventry. Yeah. Sheffield. And, and when we met, he was running a, a local government centre at the Warwick Business School. And I had registered in the late 80s for a PhD at Warwick University in order to escape the army. I had no intention of doing a PhD because I was an activist. Uh, but the only way I could actually stay out of the army as a white South African was to, to find a friendly South African uh, supervisor who was Robin Cohen at Warwick University sociology department who would turn a blind eye to the fact that I had a British Council scholarship to spend three years in Britain doing a PhD and hardly spent a minute here. Uh, and every September though, I used to come and I used to have to come to Coventry to register. Hmm. And I will never, ever, ever forget the experience of getting off the train at Coventry Station, which replayed itself this morning when I arrived, of just space, just security, just fear, no need for fear, um, and just a, I would spend a month and uh, replenish and then go back into uh, the maelstrom. So coming back here is a, is, a, is, a, is a very emotional time, it always is an emotional time for me. And in the, in the 90s uh, and into the 2000s, John used to invite me back and uh, we did all sorts of wonderful things together, including building a public policy school at Warwick, which is uh, kind of no more, but it's, uh, it was a great, it was a great uh, collaboration. I think if, uh, if, 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 if one could de dedicate talks to somebody, it would be to John, uh, because I think what, what, why, so why, why, uh, why I would, why I say that is what John, uh, pioneered in the British context was a way of connecting activism with academic rigor. And I was able to, that was absolutely necessary in the South African context. But in the South African context, like in many other contexts, I didn't really have a theory for uh, making sense methodologically epistemologically, ontologically, of what we were actually doing. We just did it. We just wrote about what we did. We just translated what was emerging in struggle into our theoretical frameworks, uh, into our critical sociology, and eventually after Mandela was released, into our understanding of reconstruction and, and transition. And when I discovered transdiscipline, the world of transdisciplinary research in the year 2000, when we invited Manfred Maxneer and Basrat Nikolesko 
an economist and a physicist from different parts of the world, spend a week with us in Stellenbosch. The discovery of this, of a, of a framework of thinking that allowed us to make sense and to academically justify this fusion of activism with academic uh, study, scientific knowledge building, which, as I said, goes, was very much influenced by my engagement with John. When I discovered this new framework of thinking, it was an incredible joy. It was an incredible release, a huge sense of relief that there was a rigorous way of understanding the way this can be connected. It was a bit like meeting an old lover, I think, actually, a kind of familiarity. Oh, I know this. I've, met, I've been there before. I know this. Uh, hey, uh, that's it. Uh, this works for me. So we were influenced by um, uh, various thinkers, Vastrat Nikolesko, Manfred Maxner, uh, the Athena Institute at the Free University of Amsterdam, and obviously ETH and Roland Scholz, who are, who, who've really written the, the kind of most rigorous methodological material. But none of that European literature worked very well in our context. So we have spent 10 years uh, rethinking it all. And it's been quite successful, and our, my university, Stellenbosch University, has now agreed to set up a, what they call a flagship research center called the Center for Complex Systems in Transition that is going to take forward this work within the university. So, what I want to do is start off with a two minute clip. Uh, that really gives you an introduction to some of the students and, and one particular case that has been very instrumental in our thinking uh, called a, a, an informal settlement called Enkanini, which in the local language means taken by force. It's a land invasion, uh, an illegal settlement which we have been involved in now for five years. And out of that has come a lot of this framework that I'm going to go through. Just by the way, I've never given this talk before. I, I normally talk, I normally never talk about methodology. Uh, I find methodology something you, you think about at the very end. I always tell my PhD students, forget about methodology. Just do the work and we'll, we'll concoct a methodology at the end. So this is very unusual for me to do. I, 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 mean, I like the real stuff. Uh, but, uh, uh, I think the, but, I think it's time. It's kind of, it's, it's found its moment. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I want, what we, as, as, as Michelle said, uh, instead of ending off and then, you know, in the usual way now, let's have some questions. Uh, I'd like you to think about a question that I'm going to pose to you. Let it kind of sink back in, your, in, the, in the back of your consciousness as we go through this presentation. And then in pairs, when we finish, discuss uh, what surfaces for you in reflecting on your own research in dealing with this question. And the question I want to pose you in advance is the following. If you can just think about your research and who's involved or implicated in your research, if they were given a chance to constitute themselves as an evaluation committee of your research. If they were given a chance to constitute themselves as an evaluation committee of your research and were given a question to answer, which is, has this research contributed to the improvement of your life? Has it been useful for you and your life? And what do you think they would say? So I'm asking you to imagine the societal actors constituting themselves as, a, as an evaluation committee and their question is, has this research been useful 
to them and their life. We have academic evaluation committees at the end of our PhD process, but now we're talking about producing knowledge that is not just scientifically valid in the academy, but also socially useful and robust in society. But we still only have one evaluation committee, which is the scientific one. Let's just, as a thought exercise, change the university. And now, wave the wand that for all our research, there's not just an evaluation committee or a peer review journal uh, committee, but a social committee. So with that question in mind, uh, we will have the pairs, and I'll ask our colleagues, our collaborators, Nish and Flora, because we are collaborating not just here, but they're coming to South Africa for some months in, from August onwards as part of their collaboration with us at the Sustainability Institute. I'll ask them to come forward and help us facilitate the discussion and obviously surface any questions and comments. So with that, This is an uh, informal segment. Most of the people staying here, they have got skills. They are capable of doing things, making things happen. And Kanini means taken by force. It refers to the invasion from the neighboring Kayamandi where several people came into Nkanini and built their shacks. It's an illegal settlement, but people have taken ownership. There's a lot of diversity here. Um, on economic activities, spiritual and aesthetic. It all provides for a brilliant case study on a, on a multidisciplinary level. The question that the group of researchers asked themselves was what can be done in the interim while people wait for formal service delivery to reach them. And so we built this shack and we found that the performance was incredible. We installed the solar home system. The feedback from the occupants was that this was something that they really liked. The work that I was involved in started out with a specific focus on sanitation, but very quickly the focus kind of broadened because sanitation is really at the heart of the energy, nutrient uh, and water nexus. We installed a biodigester as part of our technological configuration. The biodigester essentially produces biogas and this biogas has become an incredibly valuable input in terms of supplying the cooking energy needs of households in Enkanini. Now it's on. Using ecological design principles, we constructed the research center. The idea behind the research center is to create neutral spaces for people to engage with each other. As an industrial designer, I was coming with a very particular perspective of understanding the technology. But working in a transdisciplinary team offered many other perspectives which were very beneficial to broadening my own approach. You must not always agree with things. If with the research out there, there are certain times which I fight with them. If they come up with something which is not there, I tell them this is not going to happen. They respect my points and I respect their visions as well. It makes our relations stronger and stronger. Transdisciplinary research is a good framework because it allows for non-scientists or society to also participate in the research process from the start. That is a bit controversial because you're putting knowledge of, of societal actors on a par with uh, scientific knowledge of, of the expert and you're orienting research towards generating solutions. We are not doing service delivery, we're merely experimenting, but experimentation cannot be solely in the domain of words. We have the chance to actually experience knowledge as opposed to just learning about knowledge in a vacuum. I think it's helped me build my own character as well, not just my own research. One third of the world's urban population lives in slums. I really think we should start looking at how people live in slums. Take you through um, how our 
thinking has evolved. And just introduce you a little bit to our institutional context and the work that we've been, uh, we've been doing. This was... The next turn on this. So, as I mentioned, the, the, the workshop with uh, Nicolesco and Matt was in 2005. And since then, our institutional resources have, have evolved. Um, the first version of our institution was called the Tsamahat. I won't go into where it's an acronym, I won't go into that, but it was a partnership between seven faculties. Uh, which surprised us because the best, there's a core group of 40 professors that are interested in this kind of research. We also have partners in the formal research institutions of, of the state. And my own base, uh, which is the Sustainability Institute, an NGO in partnership with the university uh, that has over the years been where I've, I've uh, and others have taught our master's and PhD programs in sustainable development, which is in an eco -bit. We set up a panel of supervisors from all of these, um, all of these professors and uh, set up a, a doctoral program and a set of summer and, and, and winter schools. And during this five year period, uh, acquired research from the National Research Foundation to do the Encanini case study that we've just caught a glimpse of. In terms of our, net, our network, besides the university faculties, uh, we also have a whole bunch of uh, universities from around the world, our African partners in seven, uh, seven major universities in the African context, our South African institutions, and now Coventry, when we uh, mm -hmm. sign the MOU, and I uh, get a look of <laughs> um, The research, our research focus has been quite uh, diverse, so that it's, it hasn't been a particular issue other than sustainability broadly. Uh, what's united What's, what's kind of integrated our work is this exploration of transdisciplinary research, which is obviously related to uh, the, our new commitment globally to sustainable development goals and the Future Earth program. Uh, our, our degree is a three-year full-time. Uh, the way we structure it is that there's a registration in a home department uh, but co-supervision from a panel of supervisors drawn from a multiplicity of departments. And uh, all the PhD students have to do these three modules. A, uh, a course on transdisciplinary research methodology, which, whose core set of ideas I'm going to talk about. Complexity theory and sustainability and sustainable development uh, more broadly, which I teach, which is more, a, if you like, a political ecology of sustainable development rather than an environmental science orientation. And then uh, the PhD students meet every, every two weeks and, and we have the usual uh, supervisory arrangements. So that's a, uh, uh, to, just to give one example, Sydney, uh, who comes from Zimbabwe uh, and comes out of agri-science, was interested in why it is in Zimbabwe that so much money is spent killing off the weeds and then importing a whole bunch of nutrients which are very present in the weeds that have just been killed off. So he, he, just, he realized that the problem is the word weed and he set up his PhD into, as an investigation into wild vegetables <laughs> which were both nutritious from a consumption point of view for humans and the soil. His supervisors came from agri-science, health sciences, and, and myself, just to give you a sense, just, just one example. Uh, he got funding, three years funding, to do the research, which he, he 
completed successfully, published, uh, published the article, which I just noticed doesn't have me on it, you know, which is interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is just one example of, um, of a number of African students who've come from many different countries supported by the Trek Africa program, which is an African Union funded program, a bit like uh, the, the, the Erasmus Mundus program in the in European context. So the research focus of this, uh, of this program <coughs> is the sustainability challenges facing Africa. You can see we've, got, we've had really substantial funding over two uh, research, two funding periods. These are the universities involved. These are the master's students and PhD students and staff who have been supported. So you can see that's a fairly substantial academic output. And this, besides the intellectual agenda of building a transdisciplinary way of understanding, for me, there's also a political agenda here, which is to challenge the African universities to break out of the ossified uh, attempts to copy what they assume is the Western uh, uh, university model, which then disconnects the most extraordinary <coughs> intellectual resources in the, that those countries have from the society around them. The transdisciplinarity in that context has very serious consequences, especially for the people who come through the program, who go back into their departments and faculties and find what, that what they want to do now is suppressed. And so it's really important to slowly build up a critical mass within these institutions over time so that we really uh, do systematically break down this awful uh, conception of, of, of the university that disconnects some of the best people from the society. We've run a set of summer and winter schools. Ten all together have now been delivered. These are a week or two week long events. Uh, people from all over the world. Uh, staff and PhD students, and, and these are the kinds of topics that we have uh, 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 dealt with. Not just um, the more con the conceptual stuff around what the epistemology and ontology and axiology of, of transdisciplinarity, but also quite practical methods for uh, uh, conducting this kind of research across a range of different kinds of disciplines in more collaborative. Uh, ways. So, with that as background, why uh, transdisciplinarity? I've already referred to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is really a response to the Anthropocene. But in the Future Earth Initiative, which was launched at the 2012 Rio Plus 20 uh, uh, conference, as a collaboration between the natural and the social sciences, one of the biggest uh, collaborations between the two bodies of science taking place emphasize the necessity for changing our conception of research and advocating a transdisciplinary approach. We have subsequently been uh, requested by Future Earth to run training programs uh, for future Earth participants in, from various parts of the world. And we discovered that although this is in their program, co-design, co-production, blah, 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 there's very little understanding of what it actually means. And in particular, they asked us to run training programs for the funders of research who don't have the criteria for assessing uh, applications to do transdisciplinary research because of the disciplinary orientation. So again, for me, this is not just an academic exercise, it's a political intervention uh, in our understanding of what knowledge is about. So some of the influences, which I'm sure we are all familiar with, in grappling with the complexities, the messiness of the Anthropocene, or in fact, uh, Edna Moran, uh, polycrisis, messy problem systems thinking, wicked problems, call it what you want. There's a, mounting intellectual uh, body of thought that makes it absolutely necessary that we don't just admit that our disciplines are not capturing our, uh, the, the, the emerging realities we need to face, but also it raises the question of what kind of methodologies and methods do we now need to develop to 
to respond to that intellectual subject. So I'm going to take you through the core argument in this article, which John von Bedar and I have just completed, which will be published in Sustainability Science uh, relatively, relatively soon. The starting point for us is complexity thinking. We are, are of course, in the center for complex systems in transition. So the in transition means that we're not just modelers interested in how systems work. We're interested in the qualitative challenges of how you facilitate transition. And I'll elaborate the, this distinction between system target and transformation knowledge uh, in, in, in a minute. What that means fundamentally, which is why our university has supported the CSP, is breaking the great divide, C.P. Snow's uh, um, conception of the, of, the, of, of the two worlds of, 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 of knowledge. And moving to away from what we call, which we can in our context, the disciplinary apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, which fragments how we know and therefore what we know. And we then become exasperated by our failure to then deal with the wicked problems and the challenges we face. Well, it's unsurprising because we're looking at it through our disciplinary uh, lenses. So the famous quote, we cannot solve problems with the same mindset that gave rise to them. And the necessity for dealing with publications like that, the art of interconnected thinking, which asks us, like Ulrich Beck did, we can no longer speak of nature without society and society without nature. But what does that mean in practice when we start thinking of that reality in the terms of a set of coupled social, socio-ecological systems? And that's really, I think, where transdisciplinary, transdisciplinarity comes in. And, and the, the, the foundation should be some understanding of complexity. And we've quite, we work with Dave Snowden, uh, who's now based in Wales, and has developed what he calls a set of, of, of tools that he refers to as applied complexity. So some of you who may have engaged with the world of complexity can now convert to very, very highfalutin uh, theoretical and philosophical work right through to the modeling of the cyberneticists. But it's not, it's not that easy to bring into the qualitative research world. And this is what Dave Snowden has really uh, attempted to do. And he uses this quite useful uh, categorization of the different ways in which we understand complex, complicated, chaotic, and obvious. Um, the obvious sense categorized response, sense analyzed response for the complicated, probe sense and respond for the complex and act sense and response for the chaotic, which gives rise to these different kinds of practices. We are positioning ourselves very much in the top left, the emergent practice. So with that brief, uh, um, uh, just, I feel like, positioning of where we are, if you like, if this, I, would, I would define it as applied complexity together with that Dave Snowden as the kind of foundation for our way of thinking about transdisciplinary. The, the, the field has mushroomed uh, with many different uh, contributors going back to Piaget, of course, in, the, in 1972. Here's Vashraf uh, Nikolesko, here's the ETH crowd, uh, here's the Athena uh, Institute, sorry, these are the Athena Institute crowd here. Yeah. This is ETH. Uh, this is generally recognized, Roland Scholz's book, Embedded Case Study Methods, is generally recognized as um, the most sophisticated, uh, if you like, almost handbook of methods for doing transdisciplinary research, which is what we engage with. And being Swiss, being in a Swiss institution, being, if you like, in the, one of the most institutionalized and structured societies in the world, they obviously emphasize stakeholders and engagement between stakeholders. And therein lies the challenge. If 
to come from my context, where stakeholders really do not matter that much. Societal actors, networks, informality, multiple realities, multiple ways, multiple processes outside of the formal mean much more. So that's just, that's just a signal uh, the beginnings of, of, of the challenge we face. So from the, starting with the epistemology of transdisciplinarity, the philosophical definition derived from the Greek word episteme, meaning understanding or knowledge, and logos meaning word. Uh, what is knowledge? How do we gain or produce knowledge? What is the status of our knowledge? What are the effects of our knowledge? Okay. The, 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 the main frameworks for defining epistemology are positivism and constructivism. We know that. For us, it, we have to go beyond positivism and constructivism. And so if we take this core definition of, 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 of epistemology and apply it to the transdisciplinary challenge, it is fundamentally a pragmatic, relational, and constructivist uh, epistemology explicitly directed at exploring and finding and generating integrated solutions for the complex, for the wicked, for the hybrid society challenges that we face. So I'm starting to put in place a third category, not just positivism, not just constructivism, but transformative, but I'll come back to that in a minute. For this finding of solutions, knowledge always has to be co-produced and co-generated, co-constructed in collaborative processes involving both societal experts, societal actors and scientific experts. So that was captured in the film where I've, I've trained my PhD students to accept that what they think they know is of equal value to the societal actors that they are dealing with. And that it's not going to be possible to co-generate these solutions from within single disciplines. And therefore, what we need to be doing is purposely, purposely working across the, 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 the disciplinary divide between natural and social systems, as well as across disciplines, beyond disciplines, with all knowledge networks uh, within society. So this is, this is what we then set up as the basis for thinking about different types of knowledge. Here we are drawing on the ETH uh, uh, publications, but also interpreting that in our context. So for transdisciplinary thinking, there are three types of knowledge that really matter. The first is systems knowledge, which is knowledge about what is, what exists. And it was not what ought to be, but what is. The second is tar target knowledge, which is what ought to be. Uh, scenarios, forecasting, future studies, and in particular policy analysis. What we are really interested in is transformation knowledge. What can we already do in the present to move or nudge the process from where we are in the direction of where we want to be. Or what Dave Snowden refers to as the evolutionary potential of the present. Now this idea of an evolutionary potential of the present, where we look for glimpses in the present of what's possible in the future, is very, very different to forecasting or scenario building or policy analysis that sets up futures and reverse engineers to the present. Quite often, in my view, at the expense of the contextual richness and specificity of context. So context is what really matters. And obviously, that deep emphasis on context is, is rooted in uh, complexity thinking. So to think of it uh, in this way, systems knowledge, Target knowledge, transformation knowledge. You can position yourself in a, in a number of different ways. Systems knowledge and target knowledge, which is where I 
think John and I spent a lot of time in public policy, uh, schools, training our students. What we also, in our activism, emphasize the necessity for understanding change processes of transition, but what we really need uh, from a transdisciplinary point of view is this kind of meeting, uh, meeting point with considerable e e emphasis on, on the how. What kind of knowledge is needed by actors in a multiplicity of sectors to, to get a deeper understanding of the how, of understanding <coughs> the evolutionary potential of the present, especially those presents that have the greatest potential for what's possible in the future as we face our challenges. For uh, Basra uh, Nicolesco, these are all different ways of understanding the same thing. They are all arrow arrows from a single bow. So if we look at um, what is meant by, in, uh, by monodisciplinary research, separate scientific disciplines, uh, dealing with specific demarcated problem fields with their own journals, with a set of social actors uh, in mind. In a, multi plus in a multidisciplinary environment, we bring together different disciplines uh, to address a particular problem field, but social actors are still the consumers. They still are in mind rather than involved. In interdisciplinary uh, work, we do, we, do the, we, we do the same thing, but there's greater collaboration between the disciplines. In multidisciplinary, you each write a separate report and somebody compiles. Interdisciplinary, there's greater collaboration. And all of those are very different from the transdisciplinary framework because the key shift for the transdisciplinarians is the active involvement of society actors in the actual process. The best definition for me that I use if I've just got 10 minutes on the platform is transdisciplinary research is interdisciplinary research that is co-produced with societal actors to address real world problems. And that for me is really the, the essence of what, what this is. Uh, uh, really all pointing to. But in our article, John and I emphasize very strongly that we do not see transdisciplinarity as a new science. It's a methodology. It's a new methodology for doing science with society. And that's really, really important when you are fighting battles within the university. Uh, because the, if you just take from my context, um, at Stellenbosch University, we did not ask the university to approve a, a new transdisciplinary doctoral program. We did not ask them to approve in advance a new center for transdisciplinary research. We didn't set it up in advance and ask anybody to contemplate uh, a, 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 a new way of doing research because we knew what the response would be. It would be no. So we rather uh, incrementally built up a network of people to, to, to do transdisciplinary research with registration in particular departments. When people started graduating and we started building up the, 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 the impact of this research, it was then possible then to say to the university, listen, we're not asking for anything here. <coughs> it's already happening. When the University of Cape Town nearby us saw what was happening, it was <coughs> such a great idea. Won't you come and talk to us, help us write the documentation? And they took it in to the top of the university, and it, when it got to the deans, the answer was no. Transdisciplinarity has been blocked at the, at the University of Cape Town because it was perceived as uh, a new science rather than a new methodology. And I think that's why we emphasize uh, this, 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 this argument. So if we just get into some of uh, uh, the definitions. Transdisciplinary as an integrative process whereby scholars and practitioners representing different disciplines and epistemologies work jointly to develop and use novel, conceptual, and methodological processes that synthesize and extend, extend disciplines, specific theories, methods, translational strategies, uh, 
to yield innovative solutions to particular scientific and societal problems. So the, the last part here is what creates the challenge within the university and relates to the question that I've posed. We are judged by our contribution to scientific knowledge, but we have an aspiration because of the world we live in to address the real world problems. Bringing those together, not just in a multi or interdisciplinary way, is what is captured in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, definition. So I think what uh, flows from this is now I'm going to start digging into some of the more fundamental properties, characteristics, ways of, of like doing uh, this research. In our experience in the Ekanini case, as well as a number of other case studies, this practice of doing research with society means, in the first instance, the most obvious, that it's collaborative, that we're moving across disciplinary boundaries and the divisions between society and science. Yes, it's solutions-oriented, but without a fixed conception of that of, 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 of their outcome. The outcome is more open-ended, exploratory, therefore profoundly political. It's integrative in the sense that the co-production of, of knowledge is, is integrating not just different disciplines, but also common sense, values, experiences from, from societal actors themselves. It's innovative in the sense that we are not just building theory, but co-producing different kinds of knowledge, uh, system, target, and in particular, transformative knowledge. And it's egalitarian because we are treating all knowledge, theoretical and practical, scientific and societal, as of equal value, of, con of contributing in similarly valuable ways to the overall uh, project. So with that as background, let's dig into the methodology and methods uh, challenges, which is obviously what postgraduate students always find most difficult to, to, to come to terms with when they're thinking about their own research uh, topics. So the methodological aspects, uh, meta, underlying, hodos, away, adjourning, logos, reasoning, the literal meaning, the reasoning, logic, and principles that underpin and guide our decision making when navigating a path. For transdisciplinary uh, thinking, what that means is our reasoning, logic, and guiding principle navigating our way in and around the existing landscape when embarking on emergent and collaborative research processes. So the question that we have to always get our students to address is what type of reasoning, logic, and guiding principles are necessary for <coughs> addressing the particular research you want to do. It is not always applicable to all research contexts. Methods, the, the active process of, of doing research using a particular constellation of methods, ways of assembling, doing, using tools, is that uh, using the, 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 for in, in, in the transdisciplinary framework, we don't say we have to invent new methods. We have to assemble and utilize and bring together a range of different kinds of methods that are particular to the challenge that we're facing. What type of methods are then appropriate for co-producing in a particular research context? So for a TD methodology, the guiding logic and principles are necessary for nav navigating our way in and around a rather cluttered and siloed uh, methodological landscape, populated by research methods and activities of these three distinct uh, uh, research paradigms. The quantitative methodology and all their methods, positivism, the qualitative methodology and all of their methods, interpretism, and what we prefer to call transformativism, Trump the transformative methodology and a range of methodologies that are necessary for facilitating process. This is what we like 
to uh, in, in our um, uh, post post uh, graduate programs and in our summer and winter schools, introduce people to these three ways of thinking about methodology, emphasizing that the transformative methodology is not just an elaboration of the qualitative. You're integrating the quantitative, the qualitative, in a way that makes it possible to build the transformative knowledge for understanding the process of change, going beyond systems understanding and target understanding. So I just want to run through a couple of the principles for guiding the way in which uh, this is manifested uh, in practice and the way in which the research projects are developed. Reducing complexity, developing a set of joint uh, understanding of complex problems, translating the everyday, contextualizing TD research by embedding it into the two contexts, the social and the scientific. The third principle being reflexivity and recursivity during all phases of the TD process. Whatever is happening, reflect, uh, adjust, don't assume that there's a fixed linear pathway, and fourthly, accepting the equality of all non-knowledge non systems. In the way we we, 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 we we think about this is that this reflects, in practice, three logics. The integrative and transformative logic I've already referred to. But what we have realized is that what we call adductive logic is also necessary. We have found it increasingly dysfunctional to drive research projects using a hypothesis or even research questions or even problem statements. Our, our clear guidance to our students is that problem statements need to be socially determined and you need to show how, what the social process is that led to the problem statement. But then what happens before the process begins? You need some guiding framework. And that's really the hunch, the intuition, a broad sense of what may be the issue, the challenge, the problem, the question uh, that may exist in a particular situation. And this has been uh, now written about and is referred to as abductive logic, the theory of hunches, a bit like a detective story. You have a, uh, a hunch and you move, you move into your social process, you facilitate the social process to arrive at the problem statement. That problem statement then, in an integrative way, provides the basis for the research questions that then drive the research process to address the challenges. In our Enkanini case study, the initial question was, what does the government's new policy of upgrading informal settlements mean for the average chapter? The answer to that question was wait for the state to arrive with the electricity grids. How long is that going to take? Eight to 15 years. So the research question then became, well, what do you do in the meantime? And in order to address that question, a whole bunch of research then generates the kind of incrementalist transformations that started to happen within that community and redefine what grids mean. In terms of the, the, learning, uh, the learnings that have come from our experience, we've consolidated into a set of guiding principles. It's going to be inevitable that if you get involved in this kind of transdisciplinary research, you have to warn students that they are not putting on white coats and doing extractive research <laughs> without perturbing the system. They will be perturbing the system. There's no escape from that. Using small-scale, safe-to-fail social experiments and probing for leverage points. What we call exactation, which is using boundary objects, like, for example, this this improved shack that we built, which became a focus of conversation and discussion and social mobilization. It's a boundary object. The work that Mish does, Mish and Flora do in their rituals, they set up boundary objects in the food and in the, in the, in the engagement around the food. We all use boundary objects in one way or another. We under theorize it. But in situations where there's multiple levels of power and educational experience, 
boundary objects are much more useful than bringing people into a room and facilitating cognitive dialogue on the assumption that everybody understands all this data for what's going on. Multi-loop transformative learning at multiple levels uh, is, is important because you have to adjust as you go along. Allowing for emergence, accepting that if you do perturb what exists when you start it no longer exists on the day after. And you have to understand that and adjust accordingly. Something our ethics committees find difficult to accept. Absorbing complexity, harnessing the complexity as it unfolds. Preparing students for uh, the inevitable, which is <coughs> stuff is going to blow up in their faces. And so, if we put all of this uh, together and we uh, think about um, the quantitative, the qualitative, the transformative, and then a, a new publication by Bagali Chalisa, which is Indigenous Research Methods, which consolidates a lot of thinking in the African context about how to use indigenous knowledge systems in the research process, like song and dance and storytelling. This really sums up our kind of methodological universe uh, and the way in which we set up our, our summer and winter schools and prepare people for selecting their methods depending on the research challenge they are facing. The criteria for selecting these methods are derived from these principles, and I won't go through them uh, in detail, but it's important to empower students to, to, to be able to think in terms of, uh, uh, um, to think about the way in which they, they, they select their, their different methods. So, let me end off with uh, our core break from the, the Swiss uh, approach, which is to accept that there are many things going on in a transdisciplinary process at multiple levels at any one time, and these cannot be denied. This is how things are supposed to exist in the kind of conventional uh, transdisciplinary uh, literature. Yes, we have a complex current situation, yes, there's a target state that is emergent, and yes, there is a bunch of performative knowledge. But in our experience, there's a formal and an informal uh, process uh, taking place. The formal is, is laid out this way. Here's your social processes, here's your scientific processes, there's a set of steps around preparing, designing, joint problem framing, joint problem transformation, and bringing results to fruition and feeding that back into the process. That's the that's the classic way of thinking about it and accepting that there are multiple roles uh, for, 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 for the researcher uh, in the way in which they play themselves out, giving particular emphasis to the researcher as change agent and activist. But in the real world, what the researcher as change agent and activist is doing is facilitating uh, processes at multiple levels, what we call multi-track transdisciplinary research processes. And the multi-track the multi transdisciplinary process, we've realized in studying the work, what's happened to our students, is that this is what was supposed to happen. This is what really starts to happen. And all of this matters. Not just what was supposed to happen in the first place in a structured way if you're dealing with formalized stakeholders, as tends to, tends to happen in the more institutionalized society that you find in the European context. So multiple things happen. Social change processes are already underway. And TD doesn't, is not the initiator like in many of the European projects. Uh, yes, TD might initiate the process. But in both cases, the social and the TD process don't necessarily align. And they can contradict one another. And how, how do you deal with that? The formal track is what is written about uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mainstream TD texts. Stakeholders creating conflict pre, pre zones, knowledge and resources, first end, then mean, you know, building scenarios. And, and a kind of rational, teleological decision-making process. Fine, no problem. 
It exists. It is there. But track two is this informal set of dynamics. And we used this literature that came out of our South African context, which tried to understand how did our peace process come about. And all this is pointing to is that we had a formal level of negotiation, but the informal negotiations is what really made it possible for us to pull off the negotiated settlement. We've applied that framework of thinking for making sense of what goes on in the informal dynamics of managing these TV research projects, building trust, working with inequality, exploring uh, uh, and probing, uh, and looking for the evolutionary potential of the present. There is a third track, uh, which, you, which is really the, the, the world of the person who shuttles between the formal and the informal which is your change agent, your researcher. And here you're looking for a set of skills and which has resulted in us setting up a course of facilitation to prepare people for this shuttling uh, to and fro. So this is the, this is the diagram that we, we now use to kind of capture this very complex interaction between the formal, with the municipality, with the stakeholders, with the social actors, uh, the informal, the networks, the trust building, and the, the, the third, the, the, the world of the intermediary, the change agent, the, the, the connector, uh, the person who tries to connect the, the formal and, and, and the informal. Which is really what this is, this is the, our most recent work to try and make sense of the Enkanini case study that, that I've talked about. So I'm not going to uh, dwell on this. You've seen the, the, the documentary, the reality that we, that we dealt with, the settlement, which is where people live, uh, which is now a, a land invasion that has taken place. Stellenbosch is just here. That's the old black township over there. Uh, this is an informed, this is an incoming settlement on a hill. And the students started off building informal connections, walking painting, staying over, designing, co-constructing and implementing with participants, living, in, uh, working with people, building the ice shack and, 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 and living with people as it became a boundary object for discussion. And that resulted in the setting up of a social enterprise where all these yellow dots now, thousands of them, are shacks which have got solar energy. Uh, which is uh, uh, delivered by social enterprise that emerged out of, of, of this research. So, if you like the learning that comes out of this, from a transformative point of view, explicitly intervening in the messiness of complex real life situations in order to bring about social change, using a boundary object, was absolutely necessary. The boundary object set up the means of engagement for generating uh, the research problems and then the solutions. And we accommodated the multiplicity of different perspectives in the way that uh, unfolded. So I think that, that really kind of brings us to, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, my, my kind of concluding statement, which is, Transdisciplinary research has made it possible for us to figure out a way in which we engage in the most unequal society in the world from a university base which was the heart of the apartheid uh, system uh, to educate a new generation of researchers in our context and in the African context that makes it possible to mobilize these intellectual resources for social change. At the same time, the outcome of those social engagements generates the scientific uh, results that are necessary in order to build and strengthen our academic enterprise. So I think I will stop there. Uh, ask you to